Thank you for joining us in this session today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my topic. I'm going to be talking about environmental intelligence for managing climate and weather extremes. Uh, let me begin by actually explaining what I mean by uh, environmental intelligence. Uh, in essence, conclusions that one might draw both from models and data to guide decision making. The essence of good environmental intelligence is communicating it well. Uh, we've recognised this for a long time. We might not have lived the creed uh, as well as we should have in the past, but these days we are really, really focused on trying to actually package up environmental intelligence in a way that encourages its adoption. And I hope through this talk today you'll get a little bit of a sense of how we're making some progress uh, in that area. Um, I'm going to really talk about three things in my talk. The first is uh, the impacts of climate and weather on uh, primary industries. Uh, the second is on some recent advances that we are making or have made in the area of weather forecasting uh, and seasonal forecasting. And finally conclude with a little bit of a snapshot about some of the future services that we have on, in our minds actually for, uh, for development in, in the future. And I do that really to signal our interest in hearing from you about how we can actually design those services uh, most appropriately. So um, I guess it would, this isn't really news to anyone in this room uh, that climate and weather determine a lot of outcomes uh, in the area of, of agriculture, in fact, in all facets of our lives. Um, there was a US study done uh, about five years ago that looked at the sensitivity of the United States uh, GDP to weather and, climate, weather and climate events, and they determined that about 4% of the US GDP was in fact sensitive. So by that we mean the interannual inter sensitivity of the economy to fluctuations in weather and climate. Um, we did uh, a little bit of extra uh, work on that, trying to extrapolate their findings to Australia and came up with similar conclusions. Finding in fact was more about uh, 5 billion in the case of Australia, uh, which equated to about $58 billion of GDP uh, in 2010 when we uh, for they were the numbers we were looking at. And uh, that was done across a variety of sectors. And in the case of primary industries in agriculture, forestry and fisheries uh, in particular, uh, we noted that there would probably be somewhere in the vicinity of about $3 billion per year uh, fluctuation in output that you could attribute to interannual variability in climate and, uh, and weather. Much of that is manifest through extremes, uh, which are by definition rare events, but nonetheless they do come along and they do impact quite severely. What you see here is a spectrum uh, of those events, heat waves, frosts, cyclones, floods, bushfires, droughts. Uh, they tend to be more persistent, of course, and severe thunderstorms. Um, these come along sporadically, but their effects are, are, are felt. And uh, the Bureau has traditionally been very, very focused on trying to forecast uh, these events and to provide better situational awareness so that people can adjust insofar as possible uh, to the onset of them. Um, this is all against the background, of course, of slowly changing climate uh, variability uh, in the country. Um, yes, we do live in a land of uh, uh, droughts and, and flooding rains. Um, but they tend to be superimposed on top of cyclical changes uh, in, our, in our climate. Um, and just in this last decade, we've seen some phenomenal uh, variability. Uh, focusing in here on Queensland, uh, in the space of a decade, we've gone from one of the absolute driest states through one of the most saturated back to one of the driest states uh, on record uh, again. In fact, this is an experience which has been shown nationally but it's in stark relief at the moment because of the dry conditions in, uh, in Western Queensland in particular. So what we're showing here are rainfall deciles on the big maps. Red's very, very dry, blues are very wet. Um, and the little, um, uh, the little pictures are showing the temperatures. The yellows are, are, are hotter than average, the blues are, are cooler than average. So great variability. Uh, these are 18-month uh, rainfall deciles um, ending in those periods. If we look at just annual snapshots just over the last decade, we can see the coming and going of the wet and dry conditions. Um, and one can see the, the huge swings between almost wettest and almost driest on, on record that have occurred. And as we all know, this is very, very challenging for, for uh, agriculture. 
Um, yesterday, we released with CSIRO State of the Climate 2014, uh, pointing to the change in climate, superimposed on that kind of variability, but most definitely underpinned by systematic changes over the last century, and in particular since the middle of last century. 2013, uh, as you'll know, was Australia's hottest year on record, um, and, the, and, it, and it, um, it is part of a cycle that now has both our atmosphere and our oceans about a degree uh, warmer than they were a century ago. Um, this graphic here, the orange lines show a, a family of computer simulations of what the uh, temperature anomaly averaged over Australia um, should be, according to those simulations, and the white shows the observed trend. 2013, you can see, is right up the top of that envelope, but within it. Um, and if you take a mid-level uh, emissions scenario for the future, which we've done here, the uh, uh, representative concentration pathway 4.5, um, you can see where the record 2013 temperature sits within that future envelope. Um, 2013 starts looking like a pretty average year around 2030, and it looks like a, a completely ordinary and exceeded year every year by 2070. So that's just putting last year's experience into the envelope of what we expect the future to look like. Um, a degree doesn't sound like a, a lot. The issue, though, is that it does have a disproportionately high effect on the distribution of temperatures in particular. A um, little hard to understand this. If you concentrate on the left-hand side, there are three bell curves there. The blue bell curve in the middle is the approximate normal distribution of temperatures around a, around a medium. Um, it isn't exactly a, a standard uh, distribution, but it, it's, it's more or less approximately that. We have binned the data into uh, three different time periods, 1951 to 1980, 1981 to um, 2000, and a shorter one and slightly overlapping one. Oh, no, it's not overlapping, it's a shorter period, 2001 to 2010. And you can see how this temperature, temperature distribution has been shifting to the right into the warmer territory. And what we now find basically is that extreme hot events, those with, a, say, a, a two standard deviation reading, are five times more likely to happen today than they were in the middle of last century. And similarly, those really cold nights are about one third less likely uh, to occur than, the, than they did uh, in the middle of the last century. What we show on the right are the absolute extremes of the, the coldest year on record with respect to the, uh, the average or the normal period, which we call 1961 to 1990. And then the bottom one there is showing the, uh, the, the absolute hottest year, which was 2013. So again, pointing to these great swings in Australia's climate that happened to year to year, but emphasising that the odds of those swings going up to the hot are increasing and have been increasing for some time and the projections say will continue to increase if we remain on the current pathway. This is borne out in record breaking as well. Um, you can see that back um, uh, around the beginning of last century, um, cool records were actually bro being broken a little bit more than hot records. That is not the case anymore and has not been the case for the last two decades. We are now breaking hot records for daytime about three to one compared to cold records and overnight temperatures about five to one. So those real extremes, the absolute extremes, the records, they're being broken with greater frequency as well. I now want to talk a little bit about how we are changing our service portfolio to actually integrate a lot more of that information uh, into our products and services so people can be better prepared to actually deal with these uh, shifts and what they mean for weather extremes. Probably the most significant thing that has happened in the Bureau uh, in the last 50 years, really, has been the uh, revolution in our numerical weather forecasting uh, paradigm, the next-gen weather forecasting service, which now gives us the ability to provide gridded forecast information on a roughly five-kilometre grid across Australia. And that's opening up all new types of possibilities for the way in which we render that information. Uh, on the web through WebEye, and soon you'll see through mobile phone applications. 
They give us the ability to zoom in on a spot in Australia and get a far more localised, intimate portrayal of what the next seven days weather will, will look like. That has been accompanied actually by significant skill enhancement in the models themselves. The three big things that have happened in the world of meteorology are big supercomputers that allow you to run models at fine resolution, high resolution satellites uh, that give you much better uh, initial conditions uh, for those models and that is a great enhancer of their accuracy. Um, and thirdly, improved, gradually improved physics and mathematics that just make the, make the models more skillful. And that has resulted in considerable skill improvements. As you can see on the left, these are the skill improvements in mean sea level pressure for the five day, three day and one day forecast. And on the right hand side, you can see the skill improvements for the one day forecast for temperature uh, in, uh, in capital cities. So the models are getting better and better. And today we have reasonable skill out to seven days. That would appear to be a little bit of the limit. Seven to 10 days would be probably the absolute limit of how far out we can go with any real reliability, because after that point, the climate or the weather system becomes a little unpredictable. It's chaotic. This has also uh, allowed us to get better at predicting things like cyclone tracks and uh, central pressure tensity, uh, intensities for uh, uh, for cyclones. So here you can see a comparison of recent and a decade ago accuracy in terms of the uh, track position uh, and the central pressure uh, of, the, of, of the cyclone as well. So now we're quite skillful, at least four days out now, we can provide a pretty good uh, forecast track, uh, certainly in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, with a little less uh, skill up in the, in the Northern Ocean where they wander around a little bit and don't have such clear steerage. Now, germane to agriculture is the whole area of seasonal forecasting. This is where we look at three months. And as I've already uh, cued you to, that is very, very hard to do deterministically beyond seven to 10 days. So seasonal forecasting by definition is a bit of a crapshoot. We're in the odds business here. We're using every bit of skill that we can garner from the state of the oceans, the state of the atmosphere, to give some additional guidance to people that need to know about which way the weather is likely to be trending. It is not a deterministic categorical forecast of what the weather will be like. It's a tendency. Um, one significant thing that has happened in the last few, um, a few years is that we've been working on a dynamical model, which is ostensibly a numerical weather prediction model that we just run for a long period of time called POEMA. And just over the last year, we've actually made that the operational model after about 10 years of experimentation. Uh, and it replaces a statistical model, which was just a one, uh, one single outcome um, analysis. Now, one of the advantages of going to a dynamical model, apart from some enhanced skill, and it's modest so far, but it will, it should get better in the future, is that because it is actually a multi-run uh, weather model in essence, it allows us to look much, much deeper and look at new fields like winds uh, and the like uh, and humidity. Uh, but it also allows us to come back from three months into two weeks out, three weeks out, four weeks out and so on to provide more intelligence to, to the users. Um, comparing the old and the, and the new, uh, this is a typical uh, three month forecast on, on the left, the old statistical model on the right, uh, the new one. This is for the December, February period. The actual outcome shown there uh, on, on the top. So in this case here, the model did better. Um, and when we compare them overall, uh, over time, we're finding some modest improvements in the skill of the d new dynamical model compared to the old statistical one, uh, but much more evident when we look on it on a seasonal basis. Um, the thing we're most pleased about is the enhanced performance of this model around autumn, which is traditionally a really bad, ba a, a, a season of very poor skill uh, for these models. Uh, but there are improvements across all of the seasons um, there are areas where we're doing worse, I might add, uh, but overall it's uh, enhanced performance. The important take home message here is that sometimes these models get it horribly wrong and we need to face up to last 
um, last um, spring, in fact, the forecast for Australia, as, as published in August, was really, really poor. You probably couldn't get it more wrong than this one, in fact, if you really look at it. <laughs> Um, the good news is the statistical model was completely useless also uh, in this instance. The short story here, though, is that these models tend to be really useful when you have very strong drivers like a, a strong El Nino or a La Nina happening out in the Pacific or a strong negative or positive Indian Ocean dipole over in, out in the Indian Ocean or a strong SAM or something going on down in the Southern Ocean. But when you're in a state like we've been lately, where everything's kind of a bit neutral, these models rapidly lose skill. And that's a problem, and it's an area for, uh, for further, further research. I will end by just referring to a, a few key things that we're trying to do to lift the utility value of the things we provide. We're really trying to step up our stakeholder interaction and to get end users involved early on in the design of our products and services. Um, this we've been doing a, a fair bit of, in fact, in terms of seasonal outlooks, because there's two problems with seasonal outlooks. One, the science needs improving, but two, the understanding of the service itself needs improving as well. We haven't been as successful as we should have been in actually getting users to understand what we really mean when we provide a seasonal outlook. And we hope that that will get addressed in the new release of our seasonal climate outlooks in July, when we release a, a new service which is far more dynamic and interactive and provides a lot more contextual information, but simplified in a way that doesn't bamboozle people. We'll also be introducing multi-week forecasts. And in the fullness of time, we'll also start folding in other uh, climate and weather variables that we think will make this product uh, a lot more useful. Um, I'll skip over this and end on the note that um, what we are hoping really is that um, you can work with us to help scope up some of these new products, uh, particularly in the area of an enhanced drought information service, which we see now as a, as a major priority. Uh, but there are others. I encourage you to talk to our officers out at the stand, and we've got lots of folks here from the Bureau here. Please make a connection, join with us to, to help build a, a better product set for Australia. I hope that this short presentation has given you a little bit of a feel of the environmental intelligence products from the Bureau and our aspiration to actually do them a lot better. Thanks.